Um, I, I'm enjoying this conversation so much, and I'm enjoying the book so much. Unfortunately, I want to respect all your time and allow time for questions because um, you all deserve to be part of the conversation as well. But there's one last thing. If we can maybe limit me to five minutes. Um, it's always like pass the exam. Yeah, well, I'll just let you do the talking. <laughs> I'll say two words, and then you take the lead and, and expand. <laughs> Religious citizenship. Yeah, I, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, it, it, I, I, this it, um, uh, originates from a, a phrase, this goes back to a phrase that I use in the final chapter of the, of the book, which was contributed, which a version of this was, was, was included in another book that was about a, a series of policy positions for the political right in Australia. And there were these chapters on health and education and energy. <clears throat> and I contributed a chapter on religion because I think that people on the center right of politics, and I don't assume that people in this room are on the center right of politics, but I, it was for a, a center right audience. The notion of religious citizenship was something that I, I, I developed, building on the thought and work of other people, a chap called Wayne Hudson in particular has done a lot of work on this, uh, to recover that sense that the citizen who is religious, goes back to something we were talking about uh, uh, right at the beginning, the citizen who is religious, doesn't just have to keep those beliefs private, locked up in their head. A religious citizen is somebody who is a citizen who is religious. I mean, it sounds pretty obvious. But I'm arguing that there has to, we have to make a place for the religious citizen in contemporary Australia. And there's an interesting way in which I think we can appeal to the Constitution. We often think that Section 116, which I can't quote from memory before you ask me, <laughs> um, we often think that Section 116 separates church and state. Another way of looking at Section 116 is that it actually limits the extent to which the state can encroach upon religious liberty, upon the, pra the free practice of religion. We need to use that space. We need to occupy that space created for us by the Constitution mm. and exercise our rights as citizens who are religious. And it's, a, it, it's a, another part of the, this call for people who are, for people who are religious of all religions, to, to, uh, to express their faith publicly, to be free to express their faith publicly, and to be able to contribute to the formation and development of public policy, whether it's about schools, safe schools, whether it's about end of life care, um, it, whether it's about any number mm. of topics, mm. citizens who are religious can exercise their rights as religious citizens to contribute to that debate and need to do so, and we need to support them in that doing. That's essentially the idea of religious citizenship. I love it. Very good. And it was so hard not to chip in there, but I, I saved the one thing I had. Um, <clears throat> if you want to bring the mic stand up, Joe. The one thing I had was section 116. Um, as you rightly said, it, it's intended to limit government, li limit government's encroachment on our freedom to participate politically. The important, important point to clarify, some Christians are confused about this and a lot of non-Christians are confused about this. It is not designed to restrict religion. It's designed to restrict government. It's not designed to shut Christians up or keep Christians out. Penny Wong argues famously recently that separation of church and state basically means Christians should butt out of the homosexual marriage debate. Wrong. Read the Constitution. It's limiting the government, not limiting the Christian. And Mark Latham, in one of those interviews that you conducted with him a couple of weeks ago, one of the interview segments, made a very interesting point that people who argue that Christians should get out of public debate were in fact silent uh, about what Auburn Council did with um, segregating an area of public swimming pool. Mm. Now, was that, um, what was Auburn, uh, uh, Auburn Council in breach? I mean, not that, not that I know that the Constitution doesn't apply to the states, but it was, were they in breach of that principle in the sense that they were allowing a religious test to be introduced mm. for the formation of government policy? That was a very interesting point. Mm. And we do see a lot of inconsistency on this. And I think one of the things that religious citizens need to do is to call that inconsistency where it occurs and when it occurs. Yeah, certainly. Okay, so 
questions, open to any topic at all, but please ask it in less than 60 seconds. I don't know who the author is, but have you read a book called The Culture Cult? No, no, I haven't. It's by an Australian, and he talks mainly about um, the fetish. And uh, you were saying, talking about how minorities oppress the majority by have, you know, saying that you can't offend us. But what he tries to get across is the point is that it's not necessarily the minorities that are oppressing the majorities that's where it's groupthink by the people in power defending the so-called minorities and the same um, and therefore oppressing the rest of us. What I'm trying to get at is, at is we should, what he is trying to get across is that we should look at the way that people um, use other people's grievances to bow breed Christians, liberals, whatever. And also, uh, this is a t completely different point. One of the other points he makes in the, the book is that by using other people's, um, say, cultures or whatever, he, he talks mainly about Aboriginals, but it, it applies to all cultures from other countries, is that we get a fetish for their cultures in which we romanticize their cultures and they're not real. I mean, we might have a Greek community in, in Melbourne, but they are nowhere, anywhere near the, the same community as Greeks are in Greece. They separated from the Greeks in Greece 50 years ago or whatever, and it become a completely different thing that we idealize. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether we should not point out those facts to the people that idealize cultures that they are part of because they are actually fetishizing those cultures with, and making it worse for those people that belong to those cultures because what they're actually defending doesn't exist. So how would you sum up the question? Well, I think I'm asking whether we should not attack them for those points. Okay. The people that defend other cultures that aren't their own culture, you know, like the, say the left wing, Penny Wong saying that we should be defending whoever, Aborigines and stuff by funding them and whatnot, when what we're actually doing is doing more damage to those people. We should be, what I'm asking is whether we, that's the point we should be taking up, is not taking up against um, the actual, say, Aborigines or Muslims, it's against the people that do the attacking on their behalf. To the extent that you are basing your question on the book, mm. Culture Cult, um, I can't really answer that because I haven't read the book, but it sounds yes. like a very interesting idea. I will say this, though. I mean, culture is a weapon that can be deployed in all kinds of ways, and sometimes it's used in an offensive way, and we've got to be wary of allowing culture to be used as an offensive weapon against religious people, exactly. because, because what do we mean by culture, and who is to be the arbiter of, of not only of culture, but counts as authentic culture? I can't say more about that, because I, but I'd like to follow that reference up with mm. the culture cult. And, and, but thank, thank you very much for your question. I think it raises an important point about about the states that we afford culture in, in these sorts of debates. Joe, Joe, can you just move that back two feet, please? Yep, please. Yep. Oh, sorry, were you next? Okay. Just just sit on the end there, so you can be real quick. No problems. Um. And if you want to respond to this question, Dave, feel free to jump in. I've actually posed this question to the um, Attorney General, um, George Brandis, um, so I won't use that to preclude any of your answers, but philosophically, is there any necessity for the federal government to be using the terminology of marriage to recognise relationships in, in 2017? Now, I want to qualify that because obviously, I mean, historically, okay, there's been a process um, but it would seem like in modern times, there's plenty of ways or plenty of other terminology uh, you could use. And there's, um, you know, Centrelink has already existing ways relationships can be, can be recognised. And uh, so, again, it, it is a philosophical question about uh, why is the terminology of marriage even still being used by government? Thanks, Phil. Can I stand up? Yeah, as, um, as, long, as that, long as you remember you're tethered. I'm not going to move, actually. <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting question. 
Um, it's interesting that the, the census returns are showing us that marriage is in yet further decline, and especially amongst young people. More and more people are turning their backs on marriage. Um, and this at a time when, frankly, you know, the fate of a government appears to turn on what uh, the Parliament might do about the 46 or 47,000 identified same-sex couples. And I think it's a really interesting question. Why are we talking about marriage? Why is it that marriage has come back into vogue? The short answer to your question is, I don't know. Um, but I think it's a very interesting question. Why, why is now the language of civil union not acceptable? Why does it have to be marriage? What is it about marriage that evokes that sense of you know, political fire? Not sense of, you know, but ignites the political fire. Mm -hmm. Is it about not excluding one section of the community from an institution that is perceived to be for all? It, it could be. Could it be a way of <coughs> reinvigorating an interest in, in marriage in, in ways that are as yet perhaps alarming but unexpected and unforeseen? I don't know, I, and if, I think it's quite astonishing actually when I was re reading something in, in the paper this morning about more of, this, of the, the census analysis. And as we see fewer and fewer people embracing, fewer and fewer heterosexual couples embracing marriage as an institution, why is it that so much political capital is being expended upon it now for same-sex marriage? The short answer to your question is I don't know, but I think it raises a lot of very interesting questions. Yeah, and if I could just get back to, like, is there any philosophical necessity for government specifically to be using... Strictly, this, I would say no. Right. Strictly, I would say no. But that doesn't mean that they won't keep doing it. Um, and there may be... No, I think the answer to that bit of your question is no. Philosophical necessity? No, I don't think... I'm not sure what would count as a philosophical necessity, but I don't think that's a philosophical necessity. I'll borrow your mic for a second. Yes, sure. My contribution to that, Phil, is that um, the philosophical necessity is, is that they win government. And to do that, they have to get votes. And to do that, they have to make voters happy. And it's, it's the lobby and activists seriously campaigning over decades to get to this point that they have to satisfy, apparently, now, I would assert that they're in the minority and the power of government still lies with the silent majority, those who do not agree with that. But the insistence on using that term belies the sincerity of their ambitions. It's actually uh, about devaluing and dissolving the significance of the uniqueness of that institution and not about any equality that they're actually lacking. The term de facto perfectly uh, avails them of every legal, financial, relational right, um, as opposed to anyone else. I'll be quick, but again, is there any necessity for the government? Only as much as, as their careers <laughs> depend on it. I was, re I was recently listening to a person speaking about the era we live in, postmodernism, and that is about uh, me deciding what value I want for myself, and then deciding I have a right to have everyone else <coughs> receive and accept that value for myself. And so that really then puts a, a pressure on, on others to be tolerant of my value to the extent that it is silencing those who have absolute values, those that stand for the Christian value. So I suppose I wanted to ask that question of you from you about postmodernism and tolerance. I think you've answered the question, um, uh, because I think postmodernism is about the dissolution of authority, that there is no, there's no sense of overarching objective authority, so what is true for you is true for you, and I cannot question that. Um, that has changed the way in which the school curriculum has been developed, it's changed the way courses at universities are taught, um, it's allowed the assumption that uh, Western civilization is inherently racist um, and oppressive to take root, which has in turn led a generation of teachers to teach a generation of children that there is nothing of any inherent value uh, in, in the society in which they live, that it's all founded upon 
uh, upon oppression. <clears throat> so it's about the, the, uh, the dissolution of authority and the sense that we can, in a sense, decide what is authoritative for us and that we don't accept anything as authoritative which offends us. I think that's a fair point. Um, my question is basically the same. All I was just going to say is that it's imperative that Christians do win the culture war, because they are morally superior. And what that means is their ways will make everybody wealthier. But I think that, that you, I don't feel like you guys understand who the enemy is. The enemy is Western Marxism, Neo Marxism. Yes. Um, so this is the Frankfurt School. There are yes. three objectives was, was to destroy. One of them was to destroy the church, which they've basically done. And the last one, which they're about to do, is the family. Because this is what Western culture and modernity is based on. And I hear that you are saying that... Uh, basically, I think that you need to be more aggressive in your defence of yourself. Because there's a moral imperative, because this way will make everybody else's lives better except for the Marxists. And I just would like to know that you guys do know that these guys yes. do want your blood, basically. These well, and it's no coincidence that the, the, the assault <coughs> on, on Western culture and Western civilization was described as being taking place through the so-called long march through the institutions. The, and that's the prison book. It is, and we're seeing it happening. Mm. The pr prison notebook, sorry. Prison notebook, that was done by the Italian... What's the guys? Yeah. So we're seeing, we're seeing that, I, and I think that's, I, I mean, well, I'll have it back, back down. <laughs> but, no, no, but I haven't said, I mean, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think you're wrong. I mean, well, we haven't, I haven't said that as explicitly as, as you have said it. Mm. Um, but no, I think that, that's what we're up against. And don't think I they're think going to play for, they, they find different, they believe different things. So when they say multiculturalism, they don't mean, they don't care about multiculturalism. It's just a tool. And what we should be saying is we believe in modernity because we, 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 the idea of multiculturalism is nothing to do with us because we, we believe in reason, logic yes. and all those good stuff. Yeah. And so if somebody wants to come to Australia and they want to embrace freedom, um, all the things of modernity, that's what we believe in. But uh, the um, multicultural argument is not an argument for us. But really. Thank you for calling us to that, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Much of the discussion tonight <clears throat> has seen the Christians as the the victims of the tyranny of tolerance. Now, would you agree, Peter, that uh, there can be that tyranny of tolerance within the church itself? I could produce uh, anecdotal evidence to show that in some churches, at least that I have had experience with, um, they discourage any sort of open debate on controversial issues like same-sex marriage mm. and uh, the safe schools program and abortion and, uh, and, and, climate and, change, and, and euthanasia and, fuel, and immigration uh, and, uh, and, refugees. And, and the reason they discourage open discussion on these topics is something that you and, uh, and Dave referred to the fetish of diversity mm. the fetish of tolerance uh, the f fetish of inclusiveness. Uh, we want to re maintain, the ch these churches say, and the church leadership says, we want to maintain unity in our church. Mm -hmm. And if we allow open debate on these topics, it will split our congregations. It will create great division. W would you agree that that, in some ways, the church itself <coughs> is guilty of the tyranny of tolerance? Certainly, sir. I think that there are components of the church, the elements in the church, <coughs> the church's leadership, that do just that. I'm an Anglican, um, and I've been an Anglican minister for over 30 years. Now, I look at the leadership of the church in Australia. I look at the, what the, the way some of, about the senior clergy uh, are, are tackling these issues or failing to tackle them, and I really wonder what what's going on. And I, I wonder why it is or how it can be that in many ways a, the leadership of the church is so out of touch with the concerns of many people in the pews. Mm -hmm. I see it, I hang my head, I don't know. But thank you for asking the question. We've got to share, sorry. No, microphone. that's okay. I'm a sharing kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got two thoughts, because I think about this a lot. Um, and part of the mission of, of, of Joe and my 
production of church and state is to encourage those conversations that aren't happening and and to provide support for the pastors who want to facilitate it but perhaps don't want it to be in the pulpit on Sunday morning. And so the first thing is to understand that every pastor wants every seat full, full and hell empty. And, and if there's something that's going to stop somebody sitting in that seat that's less important than eternity and they feel like they've got to choose, then eternity is the good choice to prioritise. So I support that goal. I do think we can walk and chew gum at the same time, though. And I wrote an article recently that asks the question in the title, Jesus was always good, but was he always nice? And he was never lacking in love. He was never lacking in compassion. And he was never lacking in tolerance for people's imperfections. But one thing that he was completely intolerant of was haters of truth. He was really mean to the haters of truth. Imagine being told by Tony Abbott, your father is the devil. Wait, well, that's not very Christ-like, Tony. Well, actually, that's exactly what Jesus said to haters of truth. Uh, he really attacked the character, not just the ideas, of the haters of truth in his day. And when he was confronted with the woman caught in sexual sin, he didn't hate her. Of course, he's Jesus. He loved her. We know that. That's, a, that's not up for dispute. But what he did do is say, I don't condemn you. I'm not going to send you to hell. I'm not going to put you to death. But I do want you to stop what you're doing. So righteousness and compassion are not mutually exclusive. It's very, very important to remember. Now, as to debate in church... I think there's, only, there's very few things that, that we can say are black and white doctrinal issues. We can talk about policy and finance, education, immigration, lots of policies. There's room for grey and room to allow people just to be, have a different view than us. Life is not one of them. Marriage is not one of them. That's my view from a, from a church perspective. I think, that, I, I think most Christians are probably right of centre. It might be subjective. There might be... 30% that are left. There's a significant amount that disagree with my view of the Bible. And look, go to the church that teaches what you believe and leave your mind open to be persuaded of, of something different, perhaps. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts on politics in, in church. Um, but we, we were speaking this afternoon and um, I think the word politics is sort of got an allergic reaction in a lot of churches. But if you look at it theologically, the prophetic role of the church is to declare truth. Um, and so whether you agree with my theology or not, I will argue my theology with logic, facts and evidence. I won't even use scripture to do it because I just believe scripture is right. I can go straight to the facts and evidence, which somebody who rejects all scripture. I had a discussion with one of the former premiers of Queensland. and He had a different perspective to me on interpreting scripture. So I said, well, let's go to logic because it doesn't make sense. And by following a logical pursuit of, of his position, we ended up with him saying, well, that's just my opinion. I'm like, well, that's not enough reason to change the law. Um, and that's ultimately what you have to do, because you want to change it, you have to convince me. And it being your opinion isn't convincing. We can have one more question after this. If you're busting, oh, do you? All right. I guess the frustration, just for a lot of people, uh, I would suggest in the room, is that we have conservative elements in, in government. I, I have left-wing friends, my, my uh, stepbrothers, my own sexual, I love him. But we've got half the parliament who have voted in on something. They're not naming it. Now, Ros Ward is there on film. Anyone can jump on the internet at a Marxist conference in Melbourne, openly telling us what Safe Skills is about. Mm. It's there. The, the media, now, the media won't, um, I'm talking about the mainstream media, won't mention it, apart from the Australian perhaps. Where are our politicians just not up front and centre just not saying this? Mm. I mean, their party's been hollowed out, people are leaving, because they're just not speaking the truth. Just the truth. Mm. Just the truth. This is the woman that designed it. This is what she says it's about. Mm. She's saying it. Mm. Anyone in this room can jump on the net. The Frankfurt School, it's all there. Mm. This is not some paranoid delusion. 
We're not saying there's a Dr. Evil somewhere pulling all the strings. George Soros. And look, we know how it works. There's influences all over the world. We've influenced other countries. We buy influence through our aid. Other countries do it. China does it. What about just an open conversation? You yeah. can't defeat an enemy. And I'm saying the enemy is not people. The enemy is not flesh and blood. The enemy is a ideology that seeks to undermine the very foundation we built this house on called Western Civilization. Mm. They won't name it. They're afraid. Mm. Well, the others aren't afraid. They're openly telling you they hate Western Civilization, the nuclear family. Get rid of the nuclear family, then you've got to depend on the state. Then the state raises your child. The state owns everything. Where is the leadership? I mean, from a dominant political party. And, and like, you want Christians to so we should. And can I say, Muslims don't believe in same-sex marriage. Most Hindus don't either. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not just talking about Christians who have what, are, what we would describe as conservative values when it comes to family. We're not the only culture in Australia with that. Mm. You know, why are we hearing this? Yeah. Where have they gone? We've got maybe Bernardi, Christensen. Where's the rest? Yeah. I don't have anything to add to that. I think that's a very um, fair and informed comment. Uh, we do... Uh, I mean, we all know what, uh, the travails that the government um, is facing at the moment. I think this will play out. I don't feel confident in calling it one way or the other. I, d I do think that we are seeing people like uh, Bernardi, um, uh, speaking out, Cory Bernardi is doing so. Um, Family First had done a lot to bring about these to raise awareness. I think people within the, the Liberal Party, I'm thinking people like Kevin Andrews, for example, are, are, are prominent. The trouble is the way this is reported, they, you know, if, if Andrew says something that counters a position that the Prime Minister takes, then it becomes a destabilizing move. And, uh, and it, it just becomes so politically fraught that I, 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 I find it, you know, as a Gum tree member of the public, it's quite hard to work your work your way through the, the p political complexity. Mm. I think we do have a, a, a in some ways a crisis in, in leadership, and I think in many ways, um, many people feel that the Liberal Party has lost a sense of what it actually stood for. I do think there are a lot of people who are trying to call it back to its roots, and and one group that start doing a lot of this consistently is uh, the Mendes Research Centre, which is a. a, a uh, allied closely to the Liberal Party, but it, by promoting the, the work and the thought of Robert Menzies, amongst others, I think the Menzies Research Centre is actually trying to recall the Liberal Party to us to a, 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 a conservative platform and to um, a, a, an appropriate program for 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 a conservative government. But I, I can only agree with you. I think that we we see um, we are in uncertain times. I think politically, mm. but Dave, you, I don't know if you've got thoughts about that this is my opportunity for a shameless self-promotion um, truth is in the hands of us we can't leave it in the hands of, of the government we certainly can't leave it in the hands of mainstream media it's it's up to us to talk truth and just as the gospel coincided at that moment in history when Roman roads enabled it to spread rapidly we now live in a moment in history where truth is no longer in the hands of a select few, it's easily distributable through broadcast mediums such as Facebook and the internet. Anybody can be a writer, anybody can promote themselves internationally broadcast instantly and, and, and make that truth available everywhere. So we just have to refuse to be silenced. And, and if I can be so bold as to ask you to support church and state, we're looking for a thousand people this year to partner with us for just three dollars a month to help us keep doing this non-stop to continually build a body of work that you can share in in return that this conversation will be available for you to share with with somebody in in snippets and in larger portions and all the pre so when we spoke with wendy about safe schools that's now a resource when you Asking, somebody asked me the other day, oh, have you ever looked at safe schools? Which part of safe schools do you find reprehensible? And um, have you ever looked inside? And I was able to point it to this, to this episode where it's got excerpts from the video and discussions and it's actually showing the curriculum and, and the, the contents of this program, not just 
not just vague descriptive things, but actual actual details. So part of getting the truth out there, getting the truth known, is to be telling it to your friends. You've got a circle of influence of at least five, maybe 50, maybe 500 people. And those are people that you can influence who will then change their vote, which will then change the government. And it really does come down to, I think so many things in the world can come down to culture. It's a culture change that's needed. Um, yeah, so final question, gentlemen up the back. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony. Just want to ask a question. Uh, sorry, a comment that will hopefully turn into a question. Um, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Um, it seems like there's a sense of inevitability with gay marriage. I'm just reading this evening, in fact, that Germany passed gay marriage in one of its parliaments. I don't know whether that may, means it's now law. Um, but seeing that this is a real sticking issue with a few people that have commented today, um, have, have you observed any kind of alliance forming um, activities with Christian citizens, with other cultural groups or other religious groups to kind of confront um, what are um, issues that conservatives uh, would disagree with, such as gay marriage, euthanasia, abortion, that kind of thing? Because at the moment, it seems that recent migrants um, either are disengaged from political discourse or see the political right um, and see the alliance between an anti-immigration kind of stance, but also holding very conservative views and identifying with that. And maybe if they're disengaged, being caught up in uh, identity politics and seeing themselves as oppressed and then being lost in the greater discourse around gay marriage, euthanasia, abortion, that kind of thing. Um, issues that you guys might find uh, useful allies. Um, so. I don't know if there's a question there, more of a comment, I suppose. No, I, I get a question in that. On, yeah. 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 Are you aware of any? Did you want to? I've not been involved uh, with the same-sex marriage debate as such. My involvement has been about <coughs> defending the right of people who have a religiously informed view on same-sex marriage to be able to express that point of view. And one of the people with whom I've worked uh, and for whom I have high regard was Tim Wilson, and when he was at the Australian Human Rights Commission as the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, uh, he did some very important work on this. Now, Tim uh, is uh, um, was raised a Roman Catholic. He's not a he's not a practicing Catholic, uh, as you know. He's a gay man in a in a stable, uh, long term stable relationship. So Tim is somebody who would like to <coughs> see same sex marriage on the statute book. But in my view, there, he is one of the people who did more than anybody else to help create a space for the churches and the others with a religious objection to same-sex marriage to have a protected place. His view, and I think he's probably right about this, his view was that it's coming. And I think same-sex marriage probably is coming to this country. And churches can this is a personal view, this is not the view of CIS or the Anglican Church of Australia, this is my own view. Uh, Same-sex marriage, I think, will come. And the churches and other religious groups can object, they can campaign against it, and they can lobby government, as they should, as is their, uh, as is their right. What I, but I think the real issue for religious groups in this country will be how do we live with a change in the law? And my concern is that an exemption can be granted and say, oh, that's fine. You know, you won't have to worry about churches. You won't have to worry about this. You can carry on doing what you want to do. I think churches will have to separate themselves from the state in terms of the administration of marriage. But I think there, there will be an accommodation. My concern, <clears throat> I have to say down the track, is whether that accommodation will be revised by a later government. And that's, <clears throat> that, is, that is, I think, where, where we need to be hmm. pushing our sight. I think it will come. I think for now, churches will be exempt. Clergy, well, uh, unless the, for, speaking as an Anglican, unless the Anglican Church of Australia legislates through its governing bodies to accept same-sex marriage, it will not be permissible for an Anglican cleric to preside at a, a, a same-sex marriage. That will not be possible. Um, 
But could the law change and it become the case that in fact all ministers of religion must be compelled to do something? Could that happen? It's possible. And that's, I think, where we have to be vigilant. Mm. So that's my, that's what I would say uh, to your question, Tony. Dave? Um, I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable. Um, and what's more, I think it's psyops. I think it's psychological warfare of those pushing for it to constantly use language that it is inevitable. And uh, I, think, I think it's part of their strategy to effect change, to convince us that we're the only ones who think that this should be opposed. And I think their opposition to the plebiscite belies their confidence in that. I, I think they're not convinced that its time has come. And um, I, I think they're fond of some famous propagandists who, uh, who advocated that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. So no, it's not inevitable. And no, we must never repeat that it's inevitable. It's wrong for our neighbours. It's not just a theological opposition. It's bad for you. If I love my 24 million neighbouring Australians, I do not want them to have anything other than a stable, monogamous marriage to the opposite sex for life. Not because it changes my life, but because it changes their life. It's the best thing for the future and the prosperity and the stability of Australia. It's like gravity. Believe in it or not, I don't care. You still get blessed by it. It's good for you. And, and we're, not up, we're not putting gravity up for um, not, you know, redefinition. It is what it is. Marriage is unique. It has no equal. It is the best plan and best policy for the future of Australia. And if we ever concede that the battle is already lost at some point in the future, why fight it now? Uh, in, that's, in, in that sense, I kind of led with that, but uh, my question was about alliance building. So the second part of your yeah. question, yes. Um, ethnic churches in particular are much more vocal and much more politically active, much more generous in contributing to things like the Marriage Alliance, the Australian Christian Lobby, um, and, and through those bodies there is a degree of, of organisation and, and coordination. Outside of Christianity, um, I couldn't comment on that. Um, as this is the last question, Wendy, are you able to comment on the, on the coordination beyond Christianity with other groups? No, I'd love to. Uh, the Marriage Alliance that... Oh. Um, the Marriage Alliance that Dave just mentioned is actually a secular organisation. Okay. And so uh, they're an umbrella organisation of a number of different secular organisations. But there, there um, are a number of secular uh, people who are really concerned in this space as well. And so certainly Marriage Alliance, the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, the Sydney Anglicans, uh, also the Sydney um, Archdiocese of the Catholic Church, they're working closely with... Um, secular organisations as well. So there is, this is, uh, many of you will have heard and know of the meeting that was going to be held in Sydney um, that had to be moved uh, venue. Um, that was a, a secular sort of meeting and we all had to move because the Mercure Hotel was getting death threats. So, um, it, yeah, we, there is a really great umbrella. Um, okay. We've talked uh, tonight, ACL's been mentioned a few times, in the coming election, there will be um, forums, uh, and this is the sort of thing that really makes a difference. Get it, get, have your political voice, please. Um, come to the forums. Make sure that your uh, voice is heard. Um, Rod McGarvey's here tonight. He's actually the state director for the Australian Conservatives for, for Rod, um, Corey's party, so grab him. There are a number of really good uh, MPs and candidates who are standing in the next state election as well. Uh, I, the opportunity to come tonight, the opportunity to hear from Peter and from Dave, the opportunity to be involved is something that each one of us has a responsibility to do. So. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Does that answer the question, Will? Um, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just um, as well as like... Um, engaging those communities because in the same message I said like the political right does is comes off as anti immigrant and in the same breath saying certain cultures are inferior they're very well might be, I don't know what culture you're talking about. But they could be allies in the sense that they may have certain conservative views that could be um, dovetailed with the political movement that you're trying to lead. Yeah. 
You're absolutely right. It does need to be negotiated wisely. You can't just be uh, bombastic about asserting truth. It, you have to bring people with you, and that's that's certainly um, something I need more practice on. Um, I think this young fellow is talking about because Islam is against gay marriage, engaging them in the debate. Mm. Yeah. Hindus are against gay marriage, engaging them in the debate instead of making making um, seeming like they are, even though we don't agree with them, yeah. yes. and in lots of ways they are our enemy. There are, you know, there is a, maybe a way that they can have a, a louder voice. So, so not just the Christians. No. That are, yeah. So marriage alliance has yeah. reached out to the Muslim community okay. as well. In marriage, there's a difficulty because one of the things that the Muslim community want is polygamy. So, and that's um, that's a real thing. So, the redefinition of marriage to them is not something that then they, they certainly are against homosexual marriage, but they're not necessarily against the redefinition of marriage. Thanks for watching. If you really enjoyed that video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Have a look at this great video next and check out the website for even more interesting articles and episodes later.